Good morning and welcome to today's 20 minute update, Baltimore Community Foundation's monthly series of interactive calls and Facebook live streams that give you an inside look at BCF, our initiatives and the work that we do in Baltimore City, Baltimore County and the region. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Kevin Griffin Moreno with Baltimore Community Foundation and joining me today is Maya Smith. Maya is a program officer uh, working on our neighborhoods initiatives at BCF. Good morning, Maya. Good morning, Kevin. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, thank our Civic Leadership Fund donors for their support. It's uh, really because of you that BCF can provide resources like this 20-minute update. So if you haven't made your Civic Leadership uh, gift in 2017, uh, please consider doing so after, after our call this morning. Your support helps... Uh, keep these interactive updates and so much more at BCF going. So today I am thrilled to be talking about one of my favorite programs at BCF, our Neighborhood Grants Program. Uh, and uh, with me again is Maya Smith who has been working on the Neighborhood Grants Program for many years now. So I'm going to throw it over to you. Uh, to tell me about the Neighborhood Grants Program. The Neighborhood Grants Program is a program that I run at Bal that we run together at Baltimore Community Foundation. The program actually funds grants up to five thousand dollars to neighborhoods in Baltimore City and Baltimore County that actually want to go out in the community and do resident-led projects. Um, the program actually is funded completely to enable the neighborhoods to have a voice. Talk a little bit more about that. Uh, you know, this this program is distinct from other sort of funding areas, mm -hmm. and you that what you mentioned just there about neighborhoods having a voice. Uh, talk a little bit more about why that's important. Um, we're actually very privileged to be able to go out in the community and listen, and so it's important because we're not going into the communities and actually telling them how we want their neighborhood to look. Mm -hmm. We're going out and we're listening to the community. So the residents are actually telling us what they want to happen, and we're helping them bring the vision to life. So it's very unique. And what sort of grant sizes are we looking at? Um, the grant typically from $1,000 to $5,000. Okay, so small grants. Small grants, um, as long as it's not over $5,000, we can fund. It doesn't have to be 1000 Sometimes we get requests that's $800. It's really what you need, and you know, you ask for it, and we try our best to get it to you. And talk about a little bit about the types of projects that are funded. We want to get to a couple of good examples okay. later, mm -hmm. but if you could just mention the sort of range of community projects that this program supports. Um, so we've supported Movies in the Park to bring to mobilize communities. We've, um, we've supported back-to-school projects, signage, uh, community murals, farms, garden projects, uh, resident-led um, uh, sign-ups just to get more people involved with community associations. Um, it's a wide range. We've done probably over 700 grants since the program started. Wow. And the program's been running for a while now. Yes, since 2000. Since 2000, but there were yeah. grants being made through this program well, well before probably, that. Well, probably, yeah, in around 90, 96, I think. Was, no, 92. Wow, yeah, that was going that was before my time. Just, yeah. <laughs> but yes. Um, so what is the most important, as, as the lead reviewer mm -hmm. on these grants, what is the most important thing that you're looking for? I mean, given what you said about the important, importance of community voice, what is the most important thing that you look for in a grant application to this program? So when, while reviewing the applications, the most important thing for me is when I read it to know that it, there's, more, there's multiple people at the table. To not um, see the word I, or this is what I want, but we, mm -hmm. um, this is something that the neighborhood needs, and I just need to know you know, if they can express to me why it's important and how many people were actually involved and how it's actually going to mobilize the community, that's that's great for me. That while we're sitting down reviewing the applications, you can tell, um, you know, the how many people were involved, mm -hmm. and the more the better. So, and uh, what are since you've been again um, very close to this program for so many years. I'm sure that you have some favorite examples of, of programs that we funded or types of programs mm -hmm. that we funded. Um, if you could talk a little bit about those. So uh, my favorite programs are the ones that create like diversity, the ones that actually bring together the youth and the seniors in the neighborhood. Um, a lot of times they clash. And so being if I see a project that actually has some youth community members and some uh, senior community members at the table, that means that they're listening. Mm -hmm. They recognize that it's a difference in communication style, but they're willing to hear each other out. And so 
that's just awesome for me, you know, because the youth actually can learn firsthand from the adults and the adults can actually learn from the youth. So it's, that's, that's a match made in heaven for me. That's great. Can you think of a particular instance in which you really saw that youth and mm -hmm. that multi-generational dynamic at work? Yeah, definitely. Um, with, with some of the farming projects that we funded, um, you can tell because like urban the urban farming, because without the youth going in to actually volunteer, it's hard to maintain. Mm -hmm. But also without the seniors and the old, you know the older adults in the neighborhood bringing their knowledge for for gardening and farming and actually you know the type of crops and vegetables, it would not be successful. So that's a project. Urban farming needs youth, and they need you know some of the older seniors Great. in the neighborhood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So walk me through the process a little bit. Um, somebody submits a grant to, to um, NGP, yes. uh, as we call it. Um, then what happens? So um, they, it's about a three-month process. They mm -hmm. submit a grant. Um, I actually try to get together a review committee. You know, we at a foundation get put together a review committee. Um, and the review committee consists of anywhere from 25 to 35 people. Wow. It's, it's all volunteer. It it's, uh, consists of donors, past grantees, community foundation staff members, anyone who wants to volunteer. We make sure that it's, resident, you know, that it's community involvement. Um, and once the group gets together, we have a series of meetings. We sit and deliberate and talk about the projects, and then we schedule site visits. Um, do, during this three-month process, I am in contact with the grantees throughout the process to let them know the stage. After the site visits, you know, they are awarded a grant. Um, it's a three-month process, but it's very um, worthwhile. Mm -hmm. It's very worthwhile. And in addition to grant funding, what services do grant applicants or grantees get from the foundation? Um, as I stated, you know, I am in constant contact with the grantees, but we also provide technical assistance um, mm -hmm. before the grant, during the grant, after the grant. Even if they do not get a grant, mm -hmm. we definitely try to still provide assistance, give them feedback, you know, constantly uh, feedback from the reviewers, feedback from the site visits, feedback from my own personal, uh, you know, things that I encounter. Um, mm -hmm. So we give them feedback. We provide them with any type of um, technical assistance they may need is actually going to help them better the project or help them be successful for the next round. Mm -hmm. Oh, so even if they don't get a grant, mm -hmm. yes. they still get the benefit of they get the site some visit type, yes. and technical they still, assistance? They get feedback during the site visit. They get feedback, um, and then if they do not get the grant, and they usually they want to know why, or you know, mm -hmm. is it something I can do sure. to you know to come to apply next year? And so I give them the feedback from um, I keep notes from the reviewers. And a lot of times it's very helpful because sometimes um, I'll have a reviewer that he does landscaping. And so he'll give me great mm -hmm. feedback on why the project, you know, things they could have done different or things they should do, you know, tweak a little tweak. So I actually give them the feedback or let them know they don't have to buy, you know, spend all this money on expensive tools because they can get a membership at the tool bank. Mm -hmm. um, so we pass on, I pass on the knowledge. And I, I mean, I imagine my sense of this program is that it's particularly valuable for um, resident groups and organizations that typically don't get foundation funding. Um, yes, that is true. Um, we actually, you know, it's it's an opportunity to for them to apply for things that maybe other people don't seem as don't think is important to them. So, you know, we have the city does some work with the city and the county. You know, they they do work with trash cans and different things, but sometimes that's not what the neighborhood wants. The neighborhood wants you know, the alley to stay clean, so they want a, they want a, a better system. So we help them, you know, fund the projects that they just, that no one's listening to, no one's hearing them. They keep calling and calling 311 and try to get help. Mm -hmm. And we actually, if they can put a proposal together and let, you know, and tell the foundation why it's so important, that's the type of projects we fund, things that just are not getting heard. And, and I wanted to come back to uh, something you said earlier about, about uh, uh, this, the reach of this program extending mm -hmm. into Baltimore County. Yes. Um, where, what sort of neighborhoods in the county are we seeing these applications from, and what sort of projects are we funding um, in Baltimore County? So I've received applications from um, from Baltimore uh, County West, Catonsville, um, some Randallstown, um, a lot in like the Liberty, you know, uh, the Liberty area. Mm -hmm. um, 
and most of the projects there are uh, cleanup projects and signage because in the uh, in the county a lot of neighbors aren't as defined as they are in the city no, and true. so they love they want to have a sign so people know you've just you know you've just entered West Edmondale and you just come to my community because they want to take pride and ownership in their community so a lot of signs and a lot of cleanup mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah um, one thing that I should mention is the importance of of um, of ongoing donations into this fund. So while this fund has existed for, for a number of years, it really got a boost in 2011 when we received a legacy gift from the estate of former Baltimore Mayor, Mayor and uh, Maryland Governor William Donald Schaefer. Um, uh, Governor Schaefer, as so many of us know, really, really loved Baltimore neighborhoods. And so the fact that he was able to provide some permanent charitable good to go into this uh, in, in, into the neighborhood grants program is um, really a testament to his commitment and his legacy. Um, what types of, of initiatives have we been able to to uh, uh, build on as a result of this increased funding? Well, um, as you know, you know, uh, as when William Donald Schaefer was mayor, he actually, his, it was a priority for him to help residents complete community projects mm -hmm. in their neighborhood. So when he, you know, when he actually heard about the project he, and what we were doing, it was similar to what he had already been doing and what he loved to do. So it just, it made it so much better. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot mm -hmm. of the projects that um, we're able to fund are some of the umbrella projects through mm -hmm. the, with the Schaefer funding because we can actually, you know, give a grant to Banner Neighborhoods of Harvell, and they actually can then re-grant those dollars out to some of the smaller okay. organizations. So it has so a multiplier has effect. A, exactly, it has yeah. a multiplier effect. And so some of the projects, like I said, are small, but some communities aren't able to really apply. So they may only need $300 to get to get some new, you know, some new cleaning equipment. Right. And that's something that Banner Neighborhoods will then distribute. Right. And so that, on top of the neighborhood grants, um, program grantees that apply, we also do the umbrella grants that actually help, and that was due to some of the shape for funding. Thank you. And that actually brings up another another question that I had. So for a lot of these smaller groups, you know, they don't have their own nonprofit status. Right. So how do they get in, in the door? How are they able to receive these these sorts of grant funds? So if they don't have a 501c3 status, um, they we do need them to have a fiscal sponsor. But, um, and as long as the fiscal sponsor is able to, you know, they have a 501 status, then they can apply. Um, some of the neighborhood association groups have, um, if they have a bank account in their name, mm -hmm. they can apply, as long as it's in the group's name. So we recognize those associations, which a lot of Baltimore County uh, associations are really stickler for just, you know, having all these legal documents and everything. Right. So they'll have a bank account and we can actually fund them through that because it's a small grant. And if, if somebody wanted to be a reviewer uh, in the Neighborhood Grants Program process, yes. what would they do? They can actually go to the website, and they also can contact me, email, Facebook, <laughs> um, word of mouth. It, it, I'm looking for volunteers all the time. So Fantastic. Yes. Uh, and yeah, and we, we have your contact information on the website. Um, so we're going to uh, open the call to questions. Um, if you dialed into our call today, you can press star six now to unmute yourself and ask a question. After you finish asking the question, press star six again to mute your line. And if you're following our live stream on Facebook, simply ask a question in the comments of the video, or you can tweet a question at us using the hashtag 2020 minute update. Uh, do we have a question on the phone? While we're waiting for our callers to come in, we do have a, a question from email, uh, which is, how has this program really helped communities? Um, are there <clears throat> metrics or other data that we use to evaluate the success of these programs? Yes, so um, all, of the, all of the projects do require a report. Um, I do not require always a written report. Sometimes it's visual. I'll get photos. I get invites to the events. Um, so there, there is definitely data. And also, I know it's a success when, in the beginning, they say that we just, we're trying to mobilize to get 10, 10 new residents to sign up for this newsletter. And then the newsletter comes out, and they have 40 or 50. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's a success for me. Um, success is 
we want to do backpacks for back to school and they know they've given up 200 backpacks to these kids that's a success um I, I, the neighborhoods are defined as a success mm -hmm. because I get the thank yous. I get if without without this five hundred five hundred dollars, not even five thousand, we would not have been able to buy these backpacks. Sure. Um, or I, we'll ride past Baltimore and you know see the signs, and I know that that was a neighborhood grant project, so that's a success for me. Um, and I help because I'm only doing what they ask. <laughs> you know, we actually yeah. we're, we're we're not you know. It, it's what's important to the neighborhood, and that's what we're funding. I think that's that's an important point that there, um, you know, are programs that really rely on um, on r rigorous evaluation, mm -hmm. long term. But you know, one of the great things about neighborhood grants program is that it provides an opportunity for residents to articulate their needs and to have them met, you know, in a relatively short uh, period of time without being held to. You know, long-term outcomes necessarily. And I will say, and one of the questions on the applications that I really like is, why is this important now? Mm -hmm. And so that question, it really, you know, it's it. Once I read the, the read the answer, I know this is why it's important to them right now. It's not you, you know, you're not applying for everything that's wrong in your neighborhood. It's just why is this particular issue so important right sure. now? Um, uh, turning again to the phones, just in case anybody has a question on the phones. If not, I have a question from Facebook. And uh, that question, thank you, uh, Facebook questioner, is uh, what minimum qualifications does my organization need to meet in order to apply for a grant? Uh, okay, so we've actually um, created a very simple application. Uh, it's a Q&A style. The only qualification that is, well, it's two qualifications that I think is very important, and mm -hmm. that's the 501c3 and the qualification that it is a resident-led project. It cannot be just one person wanting to do good. I appreciate the one person wanting to do good, but I prefer it to be resident-led. So I want to mobilize, we definitely want to mobilize the community, and a part of the Neighborhood Grants Program is bringing together residents. So that's a really important. So that's the, the that's the, the the deal breaker there. Absolutely, it really needs to be resident led. Great. Uh, we have another um, uh, question from Facebook, and well, it's a really a, a comment mm -hmm. um, that says that this program has really benefited small grassroots community groups, um, and that it allows groups to define its success and work through pitfalls, if any, to achieve success and. Um, that's from Cynthia Gross. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, clearly somebody who is familiar with the program and Absolutely. has benefited from it. Um, and talk about how, how even a small grant can be catalytic for a community. Because I think that a lot of people who are, might be listening mm -hmm. will hear, oh, well, a neighborhood gets $1,000 what could that possibly do besides you know buy some mulch and some gardening implements but talk about how communities can really build on that to, to Cynthia's comment well you know sometimes a little change can make a big difference so even though it's a thousand dollar grant it can just you know it sparks the neighborhood it sparks people interest to say oh wow so a thousand dollars was able to get these trash cans what else can we do what's next or, you know, at times I'll have a project that's three-tiered and they will, you know, they'll start the first part, but they don't have funding for the second. Mm -hmm. And then we'll fund the second part. And then they, you know, they have so much involvement at that point that the third part is just, it's easier. And so we, you know, it's, it's a, we help them sustain. So it's a matter of just giving, you know, let them know we're here, people are listening. And, you know, when they, people see other people doing good, it's easy to just, you know to join in. And communities can apply, can apply year after year, right? I mean, yes. It's not like it's a one and done deal. Um, actually, in, in, in my experience, just you know, full disclosure, in, in, in my experience as a reviewer, I've been uh, really thrilled to see organizations come in and say, well, uh, we're going to do a mural project in year one, and then they come back in year two and say, we want to do a landscaping project in a lot where the mural is, and then in year three, they say, well, that was a success, so we're actually going to activate it with programming. It's like a pocket park. I mean, I and I think that these are some of the way, I mean, when we talk about outcomes and mm -hmm. metrics, that this type of leverage and this type of building momentum on a small project can, can really be powerful. Absolutely. And a lot of things, a lot of good things are already happening in the neighborhoods. Um, like you said, that, that, that project, 
um, a lot of times they just actually need, they want to do something else. They want to add on to what they're already doing. Mm -hmm. So the mural project was a success, but now they're like, you know what? I want to actually, let's have a celebration. Right. So can you just help us fund, you know, help us fund a way to get the kids out to actually a ribbon cutting ceremony. And some things BCF was not involved in. They're already mm -hmm. doing good work. We're just trying to help them amp it up a little and, bit. And, and so it sounds like it's opening up opportunities Absolutely. and possibilities. Yeah. For them. Yeah. Um, do we have any final questions, uh, either from the phone or from Facebook? If not, um, I'm going to ask one final one, which is, um, well, uh, maybe two. If, if people are uh, interested in applying, mm -hmm. uh, to, not to be a reviewer, but, but to apply to the program, sort of what, what's the timeline? Okay. Um, the application process usually starts in July, so okay. we'll have something on the website by um, May, so you can sort of get the get started getting your ideas rolling. Application um, opens up in July. Usually, in the July is when the applications will be due. It's a three month process. Typically, you'll get the money in you know end of the year. So mm -hmm. it's usually um, so you'll pay attention to the website, but we'll have something on at least by May for the following year. So it's right. and finally in the in the few seconds that we have left. Is there anything that you that I haven't asked that you would like our viewers and listeners to know about this program? What makes it so important? Um, I think what makes the project so important is the volunteers that actually review the project and the residents that actually have the character to speak up and say, we want better. You know, I want my neighborhood to look better, to be better, to feel better. So without the residents and without the volunteers, this process actually could not happen. Well, thank you so much, Maya. I really appreciate your uh, coming in to talk about the 20-minute update. We're at time right now, so I'd just like to, um, first of all, thank everybody for tuning in and remind you that all of our 20-minute updates are archived at bcf.org slash 20-minute update. bcf.org slash 20-minute update. I'd like to thank again our Civic Leadership Fund donors for making all of this possible. And... Um, and once more, I'd really like to thank all of you on the line and online today for taking time to learn about the Neighborhood Grants Program. This was the last 20-minute update of 2017. We will be back next month on January 19th in the new year at 9 a.m. for our next live conversation. You can also visit bcf.org to sign up for our BCF e-news. Uh, again, thank you and um, happy holidays to everybody. Thank you.